Roosevelt and the American West. And what I thought I would do is something slightly different from what I had originally intended to do. I thought I would try to back this story. You know, we all know the story. It's a, par it's a part of American mythology. And in a certain sense, I think that's what Dr. Taylor was objecting to earlier today, that the story is too pat. It's too mythic. It's too celebratory. It's, it hasn't been examined rigorously enough, and it's not that I pretend that I know how to do that, but I do want to sort of unpack it a little bit, because as the story goes, Roosevelt comes out to the American West, and he falls in love with it, and he, he, buy, he buys into ranches, and he's transformed from it, and he later attributes um, his rise to the presidency from that, um, that experience. And, and I do think there's a truth to it, but I think that it deserves to be to, for us to step back a little bit and so here's what I'm proposing to do. I'm going to talk about why Roosevelt came west in 1883. Not, not what happened. You'll get that tonight if you come to hear Theodore Roosevelt, but why he came west and sort of what, what sort of intellectual baggage or what were his conceptions on in the, in the spirit of Theodore Roosevelt that led to this. But before I do, I want to say, I'm sort of dedicating this to Doug, Douglas Brinkley, uh, because I think he's doing such an uh, extraordinary work on Roosevelt and, and naturalism, and I, I loved it when he said, we, we, we really need to read Roosevelt as a naturalist first. I can't wait for that book to come out. But I just want to say a couple things. One is about Alice. You heard earlier a kind of a discussion about Roosevelt's relationship with his first daughter, Alice, and I, I didn't agree with that at all, and, and I feel very strongly about it because I'm a father, I have a 12-year-old uh, daughter who is the light of my life, and when I when I think of her, I you know I have these two characters that I've spent a lot of my time with, Theodore Roosevelt and Thomas Jefferson, I had a really interesting, tight, loving relationship with his daughter Martha, and Roosevelt had a really interesting, slightly more volatile relationship with his daughter Alice. And I, if I got to choose, I would want my daughter to be Alice, not Martha. Alice is one of the most extraordinary women of the 20th century. Uh, and, and, and you almost, she's almost sort of single-handedly proof of the gender revolution that has occurred since because she was very much her father's daughter. I mean, she had that mighty, great vitality and she was ebullient and opinionated and she, she couldn't repress herself and she wanted adventure. She wanted to be in the arena, but she was a woman and the number of roles for a woman of that sort at this time were very constrained and she chafed at T.R. It it's very complex to watch their relationship. T.R. wanted her to behave. He wanted her to be a good daughter, to be a president's daughter, not to get in the newspapers so much, not to be a, a source of... Also, kind of admired it, and he understood it at least. He was not... He, they did not have a, a, a broken relationship. They had a complex relationship. And he didn't abandon her in 1884. You know, he and he, he went. He didn't come immediately out to the Badlands. He went back up to Albany, and he he entrusted her to his sister Anna Bammy, who was this marvelous woman. And Bammy raised little Alice for a couple of years, and then when T.R. fell in love with Eve again, and and decided to marry her, he. Um, he said to Bammy, whose feelings he thought would be shattered by the loss of this girl that she had raised and who was her only child at that time, he said, don't worry, uh, you'll, get to, you'll get to keep raising uh, Alice. But Edith said, no, no we're, we're taking Alice. And that was tough. That was a tough one for, for Bammy, and it was a tough one for TR. Uh, but he, it, can, it cannot be fairly said that he abandoned this child. And, uh, he, in fact, he made trips back to New York specifically to see her during this period. And it, it wasn't an age of the, you know, the, where the father played a significant moment-by-moment -moment role in the raising of any child. So I, I, just want, I just think that it's really unfair to say that um, either that Roosevelt's relationships with her were um, deeply disturbed or that uh, Roosevelt abandoned her at this time, and, and she actually became a tremendous political asset to him. They became wonderful at presidential years. He sent her on foreign trips as his ambassador, as his representative. Uh, he used her politically, uh, and she was glad to be used in certain capacities. Uh, uh, then she, uh, there, there's a great story about Taft. When Taft became president, she did not like Taft. 
and she, she actually buried a voodoo doll in the garden of the White House. She, she has this voodoo doll of Taft, and she put pins in it and buried it in the garden to sort of curse him. And uh, she loved to she loved to mess with her father. Uh, for example, you were hearing from um, Patricia O'Toole that, that he, he was uh, concerned about race suicide, that the Anglo-Saxon people wouldn't breed enough, and that the Slavs and the, and the people of, of, the, of the second and third world were breeding prolifically. And so he felt that the, the Teutonic peoples were going to be swallowed up by the, uh, the proliferation of others, and it really upset him. And so he was constantly preaching that people should have four, five, six children. And he once said to a man that you're a better man than I because you have nine children and I only have six. And so he, he preached to anyone who would listen about this question, the race suicide problem. And so Alice, bless her heart, and her pals formed the race suicide club <laughs> in which they pledged not to get married or have children, just to, just to you know, mess with him. So I think it's a rich, lovely, complex, delightful relationship. Uh, I think they both thrived on it, even though they probably maddened each other to a certain degree. Uh, and then I just want to talk about the death of Quentin. I don't, I don't think that when uh, Quentin died in July of 1918 that TR became a, an anti-war advocate in any sense of the term. It did shatter him. Um, it's a horrible story. You know, he made sure that all of his sons got into the war and got to the front, and he desperately wanted to be there too. And Quentin, who probably was his favorite child, he certainly had a, a lovely fondness for Quentin. Quentin was one of the first um, aerial um, warriors, and he was shot down over Germany. And the, the news came to TR in retirement. He's quite old and, and not very good health at this time, but he's, he's avidly watching you know, the war from Sagamore Hill. And the news, the telegram comes that Quentin is dead. So, you know, just imagine that. And he went into a room alone for a fairly long time. And then he came out and he said to his aide, I must now do the most difficult thing that I've ever done. I must go tell Edith. Uh, and he didn't live very much longer after that. And it was a deeply harrowing thing, but he was immensely proud of Quentin. And I, I think it's very complex, but I certainly don't think that he turned on war or on that war because of this loss. And he, he knew that death um, is an inevitable part of war and that in sending four sons and getting them to the front, he greatly increased the chances that one of them or more would, would perish and that that was part of the equation. And in a certain degree, uh, Roosevelt himself wanted to die in France. Uh, he um, had been so critical of Wilson that, I mean, just un, unmerciful on Wilson, really in an irresponsible way, I think. And then he said, when the war finally happened, he went to Wilson and asked if he could put together one more harem scarum group of Rough Riders, a cavalry unit, and go to France. And Georges Clemenceau actually wrote a letter, an official letter from France, requesting on of France that the TR be allowed to lead a command into the front. And I think at that point, TR wanted to die in Europe and die the epic hero. And it, it really upset him that Wilson wouldn't do it. Wilson had good reasons um, in, in, in pure military terms and because of this enmity between them. But it would have been a nice thing for Wilson to go let TR die in France. And it would have been a really fitting end to this story. Anyway, uh, I, I bring that up because I, I want to start with something that, that may be controversial, and I don't mean it to be. I really do deeply admire TR, but let me say, Tweed started the day by saying, if you, if you aren't Roosevelt, it's pretty hard to understand Roosevelt. And that puts me in a really difficult position because I have to confess I've never killed anything willingly in my life. I haven't killed a pheasant and I haven't killed a deer and I haven't killed a rabbit and, you know, I've killed a few things on the road by mistake, but I always lamented it. Um, so, I, I mean, I'm sure that's not true of many men in this room, but I've never killed anything on purpose. And Roosevelt, and I, I'm using this term neutrally, I don't mean it to be a horrific term, but Roosevelt was a killer. He, and in some sense, he wanted to kill one of everything. I mean, literally. He wanted to work his way up the chain of being. And he started with birds, 
and small rodents and things, and then he worked his way up. And when he got to Dakota, he, he, he went up to another plateau and it began to be quadruped. He was here, he started with a buffalo, and then he wanted to kill a bighorn sheep, and he wanted to kill a mule deer and a white-tailed deer and antelope, and he, he sort of checked these things off. And then he got his grizzly bear out in Wyoming and elk, and he wanted a, a mountain goat, and he just keeps working his way up into the more arcane and rarefied air of big game hunting and then of course he gets a chance to go to Africa where he really you know just surrenders to it uh, and kills not one of everything but but many of certain things and then in uh, something that Candace Millard was suggesting last night he went to South America in part to keep killing he wanted a jaguar and he wanted a peccary and he had a hard time with those but he did get some during the in the pre-ordeal phase of that journey so in a certain sense, I know this sounds kind of stark, but Theodore Roosevelt was a man who wanted to kill one of everything, including, may I say, a man. You know, he sounds horrible, but Roosevelt wanted to kill a man at the top of the food chain. He had two chances while he was out here, and he wisely ducked both of them. He had a chance uh, to join the vigilantes of Granville Stewart, and he and the Marquis de Morez went off on the train to Miles City, and they said to the Mar uh, to uh, Granville Stewart, "Let us join your vigilantes." And the vigilantes were really ser serving two purposes at the time: they were rounding up horse thieves and desperados, but they were also they represented big ranching interests as against small ranching interests. And there was kind of a class war, Johnson County sort of war going on too. And Roosevelt and the Marquis really wanted to be a part of this because it seemed righteous and romantic and great adventure. And they, of course. They, too, had economic interests in maintaining the larger ranches. Granville Stewart wisely said, no, you're, you're both, A, too prominent to be in a vigilante group, and, B, you talk too much. You know, so <laughs> this is, this is, this is, good. there has to be a code of silence in this vigilante group, and you, you, neither one of you looks like a really silent sort of killer. 